Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's really lovely to be here. Um, and what I'm hoping to do this morning is to talk to you about a lot of work that we've been doing in the field of anxiety disorders in children, really to try and give some examples of how psychology research and practice can help us address some of the big problems that we face in society, particularly today focusing on the problems that we have of helping children with common mental health problems access help that works when they first need it to prevent you know, lifelong uh, problems in many cases. Okay, so as David said, you know, anxiety disorders are extremely common and so when we're talking about anxiety disorders what we mean here is a level of anxiety or fear or worry that interferes in people's day-to-day -day lives. So um, this can be through the amount of distress it causes, through the avoidance that it may cause of things that may, may otherwise um, enable people to live fulfilling lives. And actually, anxiety disorders are extremely common. So over a quarter of people will meet the diagnostic criteria for an anxiety disorder at some point in their life, which means they're experiencing that high and impairing level of anxiety. And actually, so when you translate that into um, numbers of people affected at any one time, you can see here from UK data that over two and a half million people, uh, this is adults, are affected by anxiety disorders at any point in time. And so unsurprisingly, given this high prevalence, the cost of anxiety disorders to us as a society is huge. And actually, I think many people are surprised to see that the societal cost of anxiety disorders, this is in adults, um, is greater than any other mental health um, disorder that people may experience. And you can see a lot of that here is due to lost earnings. For example, people are unable to maintain employment or missing uh, employment due to their problems with anxiety. And also, as David said, one of the key features of anxiety disorders is they have a particularly early onset. So half of all people who experience an anxiety disorder at some point in their life will first have those problems before the age of 12 years. So that means you know, before people have left primary school. And so this equates to roughly, at any one point in time, about 6.5% of children at any one point in time meeting diagnostic criteria for an anxiety disorder. So here we have children who might be in primary school, who might be having particular difficulties, potentially separating from parents, uh, from um, being able to engage in the classroom, potentially due to social um, concerns, having difficulties interacting with their peer group, again, potentially because of social concerns, or possibly worrying to such a degree that it's interfering with their concentration and their ability to um, engage in their classwork. So we see a whole range of sort of difficulties, but the key thing here is we're talking about a level that's really interfering in people's day-to-day -day lives. Now, the thing um, that we also know is that we do have treatments that work. And so many of you be, will be very familiar with cognitive behaviour therapy. So this is a treatment that really works on the principle that uh, how we think about situations influences our uh, behaviours and our feelings. And so by addressing uh, those ways that we interpret events and helping people to behave in different ways, we can overcome our difficulties. And we know that um, from a number of trials, and so this is this the graph here is from a Cochrane review of a great number of trials, that almost 60% of children will be free of their anxiety disorder after a course of cognitive behaviour therapy. So we have treatments that work reasonably well for a good number of people. The thing I should highlight here is that actually we know that they work a lot better than nothing. Uh, they work a bit better than something else. But um, we don't know very much about other types of treatment. So whilst we can say that cognitive behaviour therapy is the only treatment that we know is effective, it doesn't mean it is the only treatment that's effective. It's the only one that we know about and that's been subjected to rigorous evaluation. Um, so for now, it's the only one that we know works. So we, we wouldn't be able to say, of course, it's the best. It's just the one that we know about. But we do have this treatment that we know works, but the biggest problem that we face is that very few children are accessing these treatments that work. And actually many families uh, go for years and years and years without being able to access any sort of effective support to help them overcome their children's difficulties. And I imagine these sorts of headlines are very familiar to you. We see them on a very regular basis. 
And actually, these headlines are very much backed up by some research that we've done recently. This is my colleague Tessa Reardon. <laughs> And she recently conducted a survey which went across the whole of the country and covered all the kind of 10 Department for Education geographical regions to make sure we got really good representation across the country. And she went into schools and screened children using parent, teacher and child report. And if children appeared to have elevated anxiety according to any of those people, she followed them up and conducted diagnostic interviews. So she identified a sample of children with anxiety disorders who hadn't necessarily sought help, but represented children out in the general community. And she found that while two thirds of uh, those families had, had tried to access some help in the last six months, only about a third of them actually had managed to access any support at all. Only 15% had accessed a mental health specialist and only 2% had actually accessed the one treatment that we know works. So I think this is really quite depressing figures when we can see the scale and the size of the burden associated with these problems. So the first thing that we saw is obviously not everybody is seeking support. Um, and then obviously we see that not everybody's accessing support. So why aren't people seek necessarily seeking support in the first place? Well, from this survey, uh, we saw we asked people these sorts of questions. And first of all, obviously, many families are asking themselves, well, do I need to go and access help in the first place? One of the things about anxiety is it sometimes comes and goes in phases. So it might seem very important to seek help at some points in time. But after you've left it a little while, the pro that might drop off your priority list, but maybe might come back on again a bit later. Many families also said to us, well, they weren't sure if this level of anxiety their child experienced was normal. And it was interesting because many of them, after they took part in the study, said, you know, I've always worried about this, but I wasn't sure if it was OK to go and ask for help. And now I've taken part in this study, I'm going to actually gonna, going to go and seek some help because we need the help. And now you've kind of helped me recognise that it's OK to ask for it. And another thing that was interesting was that many people hadn't sought help, even though they were concerned, because nobody had told them to. Um, so again, taking part in this survey and being, getting the feedback that, yes, what you're describing does sound like anxiety is causing some serious difficulties, was enough to enable people to go and ask for help. But there were obviously other concerns too. Many families were concerned that they didn't want their child to be made to feel that they had a problem. They wanted to be able to manage it within their family rather than to go and uh, make their child access professional help, often because their view was that their child would be taken off in a room and uh, made to feel like there was something wrong with them. And also families often felt that they, a sense of blame or failure because their children were experiencing these difficulties and they felt you know, they didn't necessarily feel robust enough to go and seek professional help and kind of have that message reinforced to them. And then finally, the other main factor was well, even where people did want to seek help, they really didn't know where to go. So they didn't know who to ask for help. They didn't know what help was available. They may have tried to get a referral, but weren't able to do so. So a common picture that families told us sometimes was that um, you know, they might go to their GP and ask for help. And the GP would suggest that they went somewhere else. That person would suggest they went somewhere else. That person would suggest somewhere else. And then that person would say, oh, you need to go and see your GP. And they would sort of have spent a year going around in circles trying to find the right place to go. And of course, as we know, there can be, for those who do manage to get referred, they can then often face long waiting times to actually access services. So, so th these are very much in line with the qualitative work that Tess has also done, which sort of suggested that if you sort of imagine a pipe between children starting to have problems and accessing helpful, um, some help that works at the end, there's kind of lots of holes in that pipe where people can kind of fall out um, of the system. So, you know, the first point is that parents need to recognise their child's difficulties. And, you know, this quote summed it up quite nicely. Well, you know, they're normal, childlike, you know, personality traits. All children get nervous and anxious about things. But is this too much or is it just, you know, regular? And then parents need to also recognise the need for professional help. Um, you know, again, related to that same point, are we exaggerating? You know, this is what you think. Maybe we're freaking out about something which is perfectly normal. Um, and here, nobody sort of come to me and said, we think he's really anxious and he should see somebody or something like that, which obviously having that help can help them to identify the problem, can help them recognise the need for professional help. 
Then, of course, there's the willingness to seek help, but leading to then making contact with professionals. And here we see that parents really don't know where to go. You can see this parent said, yeah, I've started looking on the internet and stuff, but it's, there's so much you know, crap really on there. You don't know where to trust or anything. And then finally, um, families find it, it's like a constant uphill battle. It seems like every, try they go in time, every time I try and get somewhere, I'm just hit with brick walls. So I think these quotes kind of sum up really nicely the experiences that families have and very much mirror the results of the survey there. So what do we need to do about it? Well, some very clear implications fell out of all of this work, which are highlighted here. And I'm going to really focus on the ones here in red, um, because what was really clear was that parents were really concerned about their child being labelled and uh, made to feel different. But at the same time, they really wanted support to know how to help their child. And they needed that to be available at a very early stage so that they could nip problems in the bud before they become um, really quite devastating and harder to, harder to change. Um, and these need to be done in ways that are efficient so that we can be increases, increasing service provision within a kind of con the constrained budgets that we have. So many of you will be familiar with a stepped care model for treatment delivery. This is really now widely accepted and used in um, adult services. So here you would start with offering low intensity treatments, which would be evidence based treatments, but which require fewer resources to deliver than the more high intensity second step treatments, which might be saved for those people who don't or can be predicted not to respond to more low intensity treatments. So by working in this way, um, as long as a sufficient number of people benefit from step one, we can obviously make the most of our limited resources by saving those high intensity treatments for those who wouldn't benefit from, from a low intensity step. And this obviously underpin, this model underpins adult IAPT, improving access to psychological therapies, which many of you will be familiar with. And now this is a these, this um, has been widely now established across the UK and involves stepped care services which deliver low and high intensity psychological therapies. And now over 900,000 people a year access IAP services and services are being expanded currently to a broader range of conditions and settings. And so um, it's anticipated that over a million and a half adults per year will be seeing people going to IAP services by 2020. And the key features of IAPS are that evidence-based psychological therapies are offered with embedded routine outcome monitoring and there's regular and outcomes focused supervision. So if we wanted to be able to offer a similar service for children and young people with common mental health difficulties, then what should those low intensity treatments look like? What do we need to offer people in order to be able to help people get better quickly uh, with using our resources very efficiently? And so here, psychological theories can help us a lot because they can help us to identify what the mechanisms are that we can focus on so that we can be really targeted and efficient in our approach. And so this is a model of pathways to child anxiety disorders that I worked on some time ago with my colleagues Lynn Murray and Peter Cooper. And this model really aimed to um, pick out the fact that children whose parents have anxiety disorders are more likely themselves to have anxiety disorders. But child anxiety disorders can, of course, also occur in the absence of parental anxiety. So what we were trying to account for in this model was the fact that certain risk factors can occur in the absence of parent anxiety, but may be more likely to occur if parents are also anxious themselves. So there are some factors here uh, in white, which are sort of biological genetic vulnerability factors, and also life events, lifestyle factors. But also um, in red, you can see that there are factors that relate to how people around the child are responding to them. So particularly transmission of fear information and parental um, involvement and autonomy provision. So I'm going to talk a bit more about those two now. So there have been a number of studies that have shown that parents of anxious children are more likely than parents of non-anxious children to express uh, a lot more fear when they're interacting with their child in challenging situations and also to transfer more threat related information so to convey um, uh, verbal information that relates to threat in the environment and also a lot of studies have shown that parents of anxious children are less likely to promote autonomy than parents of non-anxious children so are more likely to maybe step in and take control 
Now, the thing that I've always been struck by here is that, you know, the vast majority of these studies are correlational. And so, and I think if any of you have ever spent time with a child who's more fearful and more anxious, you will find very quickly that these things all happen as soon as you start interacting with that child because you'll be worried about their, how they're reacting. You'll be worried about them becoming upset. So you're more likely to step in and try and help them. And you might show a bit of that concern on your face. So, and actually, you know, studies have shown now that we really can't assume that these things are causal factors in driving anxiety in children because actually they very commonly are our natural responses to interacting with an anxious child. But the problem that we face is, of course, that when we respond in these ways, children who are anxious seem to be particularly sensitive to picking up messages from how we respond. So th this is some data from my colleagues Lynn Murray and Peter Cooper. And here they had um, young children, so they were about two years old, um, and their parents, the parents were trained to act in a more socially anxious or uh, kind of socially relaxed and confident manner when a stranger entered the room. And the uh, toddler just sit and observed this, and after the toddler had observed the stranger interacting with the parent, the stranger would go over and approach the toddler and try to get a little game going. And what they found was that when parents acted in this more socially anxious way, the infants were observed to be more fearful, more avoidant, and show less positive emotional tone when they were then interacting with the stranger. But the really critical thing is that um, a significant interaction was found with the child's temperamental fear. And basically what you can see here is that where children have low levels of temperamental fear, so these are these very, very relaxed, uninhibited children, for those children it made absolutely no difference what their parents did. Whereas for children who had high levels of temperamental fear, so here we're talking about children who uh, have a sort of natural inclination to be more cautious and wary of novelty, those children were much more tuned in to their parents' responses. And so for those children where their parents act in a socially anxious way, it led to much bigger changes to those children's, um, res children's responses to the stranger. So what this really shows us is that I think the main message is that parenting an anxious child is really hard because when you have a very laid-back child, you can get away with all sorts. You know, you can express fear, and as we can see here, you can also be quite over-involved, and it really can be water off a duck's back. So in this study, this was with children who were four and five years of age, and um, this was with Kirsten Thowell, who was a trainee um, as, at Oxford, as David mentioned. and. Um, what we did here was manipulate the degree to which parents promoted autonomy with their child or tended to step in and sort of take a bit more control, but trying to maintain a similar level of positivity across those interactions. And so here, parents and their children were preparing for the child to show a picture uh, of their own to a stranger with a video camera. And the parents either kind of got quite involved and took the pen and got involved in doing the drawing with the child, or they sort of sat back and commented um, and encouraged in that way. And what we found again here was for the low trait anxious children who were there in orange, it really made no difference what their parents did. Whereas for the high trait anxious children, they seemed to be much more sensitive to their parents' responses. And so where parents stepped in and took a bit more control, those children were then observed by blind racers to be more anxious when they came to present their drawing to the stranger. So the message is the same here, that actually, you know, parents often feel like everything's being pinned on them and that they're to blame. And, but at the same time, they'll be puzzled because, well, I've got these two children and they're really both very different. And what this shows us is that actually it's very much about the interaction of what the child brings um, and the ex experience that they have around them. And that the sorts of behaviours that child anxiety brings out of us, unfortunately, are the same sort of behaviours that can keep anxiety going. So what are the implications for this for how we deliver treatment? Well, I suppose a, fir a first point is not so much an implication of this, but just a practical point that actually if we work with parents when we're delivering treatments for children, we can be quite efficient about it because parents are able to learn and teach their children CBT skills and apply those within their children's day-to-day -day life. And we also can empower parents to then 
manage their child's problem within the family, which is what one of the things that we saw parents telling us that they wanted us to do. And also, this potentially overcomes their concerns about the child being made to feel different, because actually we're supporting the parent to manage it in their day-to-day -day life. But also going back to the studies we've just looked at, by giving parents alternative ways of responding to their child's difficulties, we also may be able to modify reinforcement cycles that have inadvertently arisen within the family. And also, I think very importantly, within that work with parents, we can explicit, explicitly recognise these normative responses to child anxiety that we, that we see from research. I think, you know, there's a danger that if we sort of take the child off for, for therapy on their own, then parents are left feeling like, um, that, you know, that they're part of the problem, but not part of the solution. Whereas this way, we have the opportunity to talk to parents about what we know and how the child's temperament may mean they're particularly sensitive to particular responses, um, really giving a very different message to the parents. Okay. So can we work directly with parents and get reasonable results when we're working with children who are anxious? Well, a couple of studies sort of really showed that we can. So Sam Cartwright-Hatton, who's in Sussex, did a study where they compared a group intervention, which was about 20 hours of therapist involvement. So these weren't low intensity approaches, but what they did show was that you can get good results for children when you work directly with parents without involving the child in the treatment. So here they had a parent group versus a waitlist group, and they found that two-thirds of the children were free of their anxiety disorder at the end of that intervention, despite the fact that the children weren't involved in the treatment at all. And then Alison Waters in Australia also uh, showed that this could be an effective treatment. And interestingly there, they had a parent-only treatment, and they had a parent and child treatment, which involved twice as much therapy time, because you were running parent and child uh, sessions in parallel, and they found absolutely no difference between the two. So whichever way you worked, the outcomes were similar, but obviously you could do it in half the time if you worked just with the parents. Okay. So we wanted to think about, well, how can we deliver this more efficiently then? Thinking about the way that guided self-help works, for example, in adult IAP services. And so we developed a guided CBT self-help well, it's not really self-help, parent help version, in which parents are helped to work through these processes. So having just about five hours of therapist input rather than the traditional 16 to 20 hours of therapist input. So here parents would be given um, the book and the, th and the therapist would encourage them to work through it practice key skills with them and help them problem solve challenges that arose. Um, and here's Kirsten who got an MRC fellowship to conduct this work, which was conduct comparing the five hour version to an even briefer two and a half hour version to a waitlist condition. You'll see in this particular case, a lot of people were assessed for eligibility who, and weren't eligible. That was because at this point in time, we were working on the basis that this is a low intensity treatment. We want to aim it at people who have a good prognosis. So we didn't include families where parents also had a current anxiety disorder. I'll talk to you a bit more about that a bit later on. But here, basically, we found really encouraging results. That even after just five hours of intervention, half of the children were free of their anxiety disorder immediately. Um, and then six months later, about 75% were free after the five hour version. The two and a half hour version took a bit longer to get there. And one of the things that was really interesting was that because low intensity interventions, if you want to deliver them at scale, one of the things that you want to be able to do is to make sure they can be delivered by a whole range of professionals so who, can, uh, who don't need to have necessarily had years and years and years of expensive training. So one of the things that we were really interested to see was that when we used the five hour version, it didn't matter whether we had clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, others who had extensive CBT training, or we had, uh, for example, PhD students who were trained in this method and then supervised in it, they got exactly the same outcomes immediately post-treatment. Whereas it looked like that might not be the case for the very, very brief treatment where you, know, you maybe have to be, feel a bit more confident about being able to manage the time and keep families going. But it certainly suggested that the five-hour version may be a good uh, model that we can use in services with primary wellbeing practitioners and other sorts of low-intensity psychological therapists. 
But obviously that wasn't, that's not enough because you don't want to just know it's better than nothing. You want to know that this is better than what people might have been getting otherwise. So the, we then went on to do a trial across the primary child and adolescent mental health services in Oxfordshire. And here we were comparing the guided parent-delivered CBT to a treatment called solution-focused brief therapy uh, because that was the treatment that was often used in these services because it is something that can be delivered in a setting where you're only able to offer a small number of sessions. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But essentially, everybody had the treatment, then had a follow-up assessment, and they were followed up again about six months later. And critically, we wanted to include a full economic uh, assessment, health economic assessment, because it's really important to us for these low intensity treatments to be looking at the cost effectiveness of these kind of approaches. So the comparison treatment here was brief solution focused therapy. As I said, that was the one treatment that all of the therapists in those services had received training in. And really there are two really core principles in this treatment. The one is that, well, no, nobody's perfect, and the good thing is that that applies to our problems as well as everything else. So if we can find exceptions to our problems, that can help us to find potential solutions we can use in other situations. And the other really critical thing is that knowing where you want to get to makes getting there more likely. So you go through an a ongoing process of mapping how close you are to your goals and how you've moved towards your goals. And, um, and certainly the UK um, organisation for solution focused therapy say that this is effective in 65 to 83% of cases in an average of four to five sessions. So uh, although it hadn't been evaluated specifically for anxiety disorders. So in this, tri this, this trial, we randomised um, 136 children. And what you can see is at the, end of, at the beginning of treatment here at the baseline, the randomisation didn't manage to wash out all differences between the groups. So actually, our guided parent-delivered CBT group did start off a little bit more severe uh, than the other group. But what you can see is very similar reductions in child anxiety symptoms over time. And interestingly, this is child self-report, and obviously the children are not involved in one of the treatments. So it's quite interesting that, nonetheless, they're reporting similar amounts of uh, anxiety reduction over time. We see the same thing for parent report, uh, start off slightly higher, but they're basically similar reductions over time in the two treatments. And when we look at how many of them were considered much or very much improved, uh, these, once we take into account those differences at baseline, you can see the difference between the groups. You end up with a P of 0.95. We really don't see those very often. There really was no difference between these treatments in clinical outcomes at all. But both of them getting um, the sorts of levels of recovery that we're seeing from the Cochrane Review from uh, much more intensive treatments. Um, and again here, in terms of free of primary diagnosis, over 60% in both conditions were free of their diagnosis by six months, despite these both being very brief interventions. So yes, compare that to a 14-hour intervention delivered by therapists, uh, supervised by sort of world experts. We found these results really encouraging, given these were such brief treatments. Now, as I mentioned, we also conducted a health economic analysis. And here we found some really interesting and slightly surprising things, because obviously both of these are brief treatments. But what we found was that the time spent delivering treatment was still significantly less in the guided parent delivered CBT approach. And we, we thought this is probably just an anomaly. But when we spoke to therapists about it, they said, oh, no, that makes absolute sense. Having a very structured approach where we can do some of the sessions over the telephone definitely makes things a lot quicker. And that tra translates into quite a big cost difference between the two. So there was a total mean difference of about £133 uh, per um, case seen here. And actually, interestingly, although the solution-focused brief therapy was predominantly done with children, parents missed more work time to do that one because they had to get their child there, whereas the guided parent-delivered CBT, because some of it's on the phone, parents could do it at times that suited them, they, le they missed less time off work. Uh, and when we take that into account, there's even greater cost savings. Um, and this here, what this really shows you here is up the, uh, on the bottom graph, that's the probability that however much you're willing to pay for every quality of life year gained through the treatment, um, 
that's the probability of one treatment being over effective, cost effective compared to the other. And as you can see, the line basically is very near one all the way along. So however much you'd be willing to pay for the benefits of this treatment, the uh, pa guided parent delivered CBT was very likely to be the more cost effective. Okay. So what we found from all of those is that actually the clinical outcomes weren't very different between those two treatments, but there were substantial cost savings, which obviously translate to us being able to see and work with more families uh, if we follow these kind of quite structured approaches where we can work directly with parents. And these, these, uh, even though the last study there was conducted across NHS services, obviously it's still being conducted within a research trial, which obviously may put particular constraints on things. But um, this is Rachel Evans, um, and she did a, a nice study where she went out and worked with NHS Trust to be able to access data from um, routine data that they'd collected when they'd delivered this guided parent delivered CBT approach. In this case, they were all delivering it in groups uh, because that's what worked best for their services. But what she found very consistent with the findings uh, that we found previously were that there were significant improvements on the routine outcome measures that were collected, but unfortunately <laughs> there weren't all that many collected. But the more uh, compelling is that actually three quarters of families were able to be discharged at the end of that treatment with only a quarter needing to be stepped up to a high intensity treatment. So when we take this into the real world, we're st seeing consistent findings. Well, obviously, one of the things that we saw is if we're going to have this kind of more efficient system, uh, we need to understand who's going to need to be stepped up. And we want to predict that so that we can we don't offer treatments that are not going to be effective to people. Um, if we know that, you know, we, we get people straight into treatments that are going to work. So who doesn't benefit from these treatments? And a lot of people um, have a lot of assumptions about what it might be. And so these are probably the most common things that people say to us. Well, you know, obviously, the more severe people are going to need more intensive treatment. Older children um, within this pre-adolescent pre group are going to be need to see by a therapist. Other problems, other comorbid problems are likely to get in the way and it's not going to work if the parent is anxious too. So what have we found about these things? Well, the first thing is that when we look at predictors of outcome, in sort of a lot of those things that we mentioned there, anxiety, symptom severity, comorbid behaviour problems, but also particular types of anxiety disorders, none of them predicted outcome. So in terms of those first three assumptions, so far we don't have any evidence that that's the case. What about parent anxiety? Well, this is really important because a lot of studies have shown that when you do traditional CBT, the outcomes are a lot worse when parents are also anxious. So here are four studies. In, in all cases, either parents had anxiety disorders or not, or high trait anxiety or not. And this shows you children's outcomes. And in all cases, you can see children's outcomes are basically cut in half if the parent also had an anxiety problem. And that might make sense because if we go back to this model, we can see that many of the risk factors might be more likely to occur in the context of parent anxiety. So we wanted to understand this a bit more and see what does happen when parents and, uh, and children interact when they both have an anxiety disorder compared to when just the child has an anxiety disorder and the parent isn't anxious. So we asked parents and children to interact in a number of tasks in the lab. So these were all mildly stressful tasks. One where you have to do a very difficult puzzle, uh, one where you have to find scary things from inside a black box. Actually, none of these things are particularly scary, but since um, I'm a Celebrity has been on, people assume we have much worse things in there than we really do. And, uh, and children also need to prepare to give a speech. And what we found was that, indeed, the, if parents themselves were also anxious, we did see different patterns of responding uh, when their children became anxious in this task. So along the bottom line here, you can see how anxious the child looked in the task. And what you see is that in the green line is the, is the mums who had an anxiety disorder. And as children looked more anxious in these tasks, we saw a dramatic increase in the extent to which the, the parents who were anxious stepped in and were, were more likely to be intrusive in the task. Whereas on the other hand, the, the non-anxious parents, as their children became more anxious, they would tend to sort of step back and, uh, and let their child take a bit more control. Similarly, when we look at the quality of the relationship, so this is sort of the degree of sort of warmth versus negativity in the relationship, you can see that it really plummets as children 
children become anxious when the parent is also anxious. And in terms of expressed anxiety, we see a similar pattern. So as uh, children look more anxious in the task, we see the parents who are anxious, they also look more and more anxious. Whereas somehow the non-anxious parents manage to look calmer and calmer as their child becomes more and more anxious in the task. And one of the things that we found was that the relationship between the maternal group and the quality of relationship was that this was accounted for by the extent to which the mums felt unsurprisingly stressed during the task. So if parents didn't feel that stress, then it didn't really make that much difference to the quality of relationship, no matter whether they were a parent with an anxiety disorder or not. So what this might suggest is that, well, if parents are responding to their child's fear or anxiety with fear, intrusiveness, negativity, then you can imagine that that is likely to inhibit the child's adaptive learning from exposure to fear-inducing stimuli. Um, and so what we might want to do here is to have adjunctive treatments where parents are also anxious um, to help them to overcome these sorts of natural responses. So this is what we then went on to do, and this is Rachel Hiller. So here what we did is we supplemented the usual approach with an approach where we were helping parents to tolerate their children's negative emotions um, and um, to manage those whilst helping their children to face their fears. And so, first of all, obviously, we wanted to see, well, had we successfully done that through the intervention? And when we look at this tolerating children's negative emotion condition, we did find that there were parents were less anxious uh, from pre to post treatment in the stress when we repeated a stress task. We also found that on a measure that, that was a broad measure of parents' responses to their children's stress, there was also a reduction. But this is the, obviously the great thing about randomised controlled trials, we saw exactly the same pattern for the parents who didn't get that and the parents who just had the standard treatment. And similarly, we saw when we looked at parents' responses, we saw exactly the same thing happen whether uh, they had this extra treatment or not. And unsurprisingly, given that, we found that there was absolutely no difference in children's outcomes, whether we gave them this extra stuff or not. And actually, what we were most surprised by is that the outcomes were really good. So in this case, so over 70% of children were um, much or very much improved at the end of that treatment. And as in previous studies, 50 to 60% were free of their primary diagnosis after that very brief treatment. And just for interest, both in both conditions, we saw a significant reduction in parent anxiety, which was at least as much in the condition where we didn't specifically address it. So what this seems to tell us is that actually we can still get good outcomes when parents themselves have difficulties with anxiety. And actually what we might want to do is rather than get hung up on the fact that parents are experiencing these difficulties um, and to feel we need to address that, instead we need to think about, well, how do we empower parents to be able to support their children? Because actually by doing that, it may also bring benefits to the parents themselves. So at this point, we really don't know. Obviously, the treatment doesn't work for everybody. There is definitely room for improvement. But at the moment, we don't know who those people are and how we need to address it. And that's work we need to continue to do. The other thing that we need to continue to do, of course, is to make this more accessible. A treatment that involves giving people a book is obviously going to be a huge turnoff for a lot of people and not going to be accessible. So how do we make it more accessible? And over the last um, couple of years, we've been co-designing with parents, children and NHS clinicians an online version of this treatment that has minimal text uh, and has audio versions of everything uses animation, uses video and communicates in different ways and enables parents to access uh, the information and support at times that are convenient for them, which we, is typically after children have gone to bed and the washing up's done and all those other things are out the way. So, and this is, uh, and one of the things that parents told us through this co-design process is that they, they liked it that we were working with them and that the focus wasn't on their child. They liked that because they didn't want their child to be made to feel different, but they did want some tools to help them engage their child. So the children we work with created this fantastic app in which the, uh, they can play all sorts of games, but basically the parent is in control of their wallet, which enables them to buy all the extra kit and unlock games and so on. So the parent can use that to encourage their child to have a go and try out things they might otherwise be afraid to do. 
So where are we? So we have some good evidence for low intensity treatments. They've been delivered in individuals uh, in a group basis within routine settings and we're moving towards online as well. We still need to improve, to continue to improve, the, improve these treatments and make them more accessible. But the big question that we're, but, but you know, what we're seeing is that actually the outcomes that we're getting are very similar to those from the traditional, much longer high intensity CBT. So what we really still don't know is what we offer next. So what would the high intensity treatment look like for those who don't benefit from this low intensity one? And that's where we need to keep working to make sure that we can together from all of this sort of broad range of research be able to offer treatments that benefit the largest number of people so that we can really uh, offer treatments that work and really nip these sorts of difficulties in the bud at this early stage when people first need the help uh, rather than them living sometimes a lifetime of difficulties. So I'd just like to finish by thanking um, my team who have done a lot of this fantastic work and, uh, and to just say, do get in touch if, uh, if it would be helpful. And one of the things, as David said, is that we've, uh, me and the other NIHR psychology advocates have recently set up this Twitter account at the bottom, which is really there to try and encourage uh, people uh, coming from clinical and other practitioner psychology professions to get engaged with research, whether that's sort of in a big way or a small way. So we're there to kind of try and help people to identify opportunities and access support to do that. So please do get involved um, and join in that conversation. And hopefully we'll see you on there. Sorry, put that back. Thank you.